Making It Work is brought to you by the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary and the Theology of Work Project. Welcome to Making It Work. Through conversation, scripture, and stories, we invite God into work's biggest challenges so that you can live out your purpose in the workplace. I'm Mark Roberts. And I'm Leah Archibald. And this is Making It Work. Have you ever felt God calling you to something unexpected and outside your comfort zone? Or perhaps you found yourself in a position at work where you've wondered if you were the right person for the job. Today's guest, Jessica Tanacity Bio, has been called into many unexpected roles at work. Although she dreamt of going to seminary and working in church ministry, God called her to business school instead. She now works for the MNC Group in Financial Services, Philanthropy, and Education Sectors, where she continues to follow God through unexpected challenges, like leading her team through the pandemic. She's here to talk about her experience of responding to God when He calls us out of our comfort zone. Jessica Tanacity Bio, welcome to the Making It Work podcast. Hi, Leah. Good to be here with you. It's so good to have you. I wonder if you could just talk about a time in your life where you felt like God was calling you to something that was outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I grew up in a family where um, we were always directed towards the business world. And there was a time in my life, um, particularly when I was in undergrad, that I started thinking about Um, where it was that God was calling me to. I think I started having an existential crisis thinking about what is the meaning of life and so forth. Um, I grew up in a Christian home and particularly in that season, I started um, serving at church and actually finding um, joy in serving, especially in youth ministry. And um, the desire to go to seminary started uh, surfacing. started with uh, just a desire to know more about God's word and to be equipped for the work. Mm. And I think um, I kept it in my heart for around three years because as uh, the middle child at home, I tend to be more of the timid kind. And I didn't dare to bring it before my parents who were always kind of... um, teaching us and leading us towards like the business world. Long story short, by God's grace, um, I was finally able to go to seminary with my parents' blessings. And just about when I was about to graduate from seminary and coming back home thinking that, okay, this is it. I'm going to serve full time um, in the church. Um, I think that year, particularly 2017 leading up to 2018, Um, I started wrestling with the thought of um, where God was leading me, particularly um, with everything that he's entrusted to my family's care. And now that it's literally ahead of me. And um, in seminary, funnily, I started talking with some professors about the theology of work. Mm -hmm. And I think it really challenged me to think about how I think all these years Um, I thought about ministry as simply being confined within the four walls of the church when serving God is so much more than that. Um, As Christians, we affirm that God is the creator of the universe, right? And he owns everything. Um, But why is it that we put him in a box and (laughs) we tend to just simply think that, okay, God rules within the church. That's it. Mm. Um, but the church we, in a box. The church in a box, that's right. <laughs> but if really we believe that he is um, sovereign over all things, right? Wherever he leads us, um, we are called to missions. Um, we are called as missionaries wherever we are. Um, and I think that you're particularly, I had to deal with my own heart <laughs> and my own rebelliousness um, through the years of not wanting to Uh, take on something that God's entrusted to my family's care. And um, yeah, I started thinking about 
the possibility of um, coming into the workplace as a means of um, serving the Lord. I'm so curious what made you experience this shift in calling? Because as you said, for a while, you really felt called into ministry. And then was it learning about the theology of work at seminary that really brought along this shift? What was it in particular that you learned that made you start to see your calling differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I really love about being at seminary was I think it was a few years of sabbatical, (laughs) you know, like just being, um, diving into the word. And I think one of the things that I loved and wrestled a lot with was my own heart in that season. You know, um, the heart is deceitful above all else. And one of the things that I really uh, brought before the Lord was how, my goodness, all of us, like as human beings were so rebellious against the Lord. And um, for my own self, I think funnily, um, ironically, um, I found myself rebelling um, in a way that maybe um, in the Christian world, it would seem like it wasn't rebellion. I don't Um, think a lot of rebels go to seminary. You know, (laughs) I I think... I don't know who you were rebelling against by going to seminary, but you know, I yeah. I see rebels in other areas. And- yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think for me, like rebelling was um, a lot more to do with rejecting, um, in a sense, like my birthright. You know, like something mm. that the Lord has entrusted um, within my own family. Um, I know that, of course, like God leads us um, all uh, through different, two different callings for sure. And um, be it in the laying down of whatever birthright we may have, you know, or uh, taking it on. But for me, I think for the most part, like growing up, I thought that following Jesus meant I had to reject my birthright, I had to reject everything. Um, I grew up in quite a conservative um Christian school, which taught that basically, um, if you want to follow Jesus, you have, you have to leave everything, right? Um, hmm. The the rich young ruler asked Jesus, hmm. um, and and that was what was in my mind that if I were to follow the Lord, I had to reject all these material blessings that the Lord had given me, um, including the family business, or including the, the family business. Yeah, yeah, but then. I think one of the things that um, in seminary particularly, uh, not just through uh, diving to the word nor learning more about the theology of work, but also meeting people, um, meeting a mentor particularly there at seminary who had been to business school and also had been to seminary before, um, who ended up really challenging me to think more about um, God's mission field as being the workplace. Hmm. Was there a particular Bible verse in particular, or was there a particular piece of scripture that kind of Mm -hmm. guided you as you were making this change in your sense of calling? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there was a book that I read, um, particularly in one of the classes that we had uh, called Vocation and Calling by um, Gordon Smith, I think. Um, And the front page, it says, it has this little quote um, that says, God's calling in your life is where your deepest passions meet the world's deepest needs. Um, Mm. And I think that really made me think a lot um, about how the Lord has shaped me with all my... um, leanings, tendencies, um, the gifts he's bestowed, including the gift of family, um, the entrustments and everything. Mm. Uh, And I think that made me think about, okay, if this is what God's placed in my hands, how can I steward it better? Um, And how can I steward it well? Um, And to particularly follow the call of Jesus when he says that the greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. And I think part of meeting the needs around us is that and loving others well. Um, And I think one of the 
For sure, one of the passages that also helped me wrestle with that is um, the book of Genesis, particularly in mm-hmm. the creation account, how um, I think we all talk about this, right? I think every year, everyone, um, if, if we uh, resolve to start reading scripture, we'll start with Genesis again. And we read well, those all the time. Well, of course, it's right in the front. <laughs> exactly. Turn right to it. <laughs> and it's like, we read this all the time, but I think it just dawned on me that God is a God who worked, you know, um, mm. and he didn't diminish uh, just a- every kind of work. Like he's the painter of the skies. He's the gardener, you know, and um, these are all like work, work that God does. And um, it's not necessarily confined into church ministry work, but it's um, Mm. work that is good nonetheless, you know, and work that is glorifying to him. I want to bring Mark into the conversation. Mark, what are you hearing? There's so much in what Jessica shared in her story of discerning her calling. What are you hearing in terms of what calling means for us and its interaction with work and family and all the different responsibilities in our lives? Yeah. Many, many thoughts. So I just need to say one of them is, and it, that Jessica, for, for people like Leah and me who've been working at Faith and Work for a while, the fact that you went to seminary and got a good theology of work just just gives joy to our hearts. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I think I know where you went, and I, I, I they, they have some great folks there. But that's just very, because that's relatively new, as, as I expect you know. There would be a time yeah. in which... A theology of work would not really be taught much in a seminary context. So anyway, that's just <laughs> amen to that. That's so exciting, and it is all in the, the little Bible. light bulbs and balloons well, are going <laughs> off in our heads. Well, yeah. well, partly and partly too, just who you said. Yeah, it's like in Genesis one. It's from the first chapter to the last one, and that gets overlooked. So partly, I'm just thinking, oh, that's so great. I love your story. Number one. Uh, number two, I'm just impressed at your own articulateness about faith and work and your own, your own journey. And, and, uh, you know, it's obvious that, that the, the growing up experience you had in your conservative school and in your family, and then in, in college and in seminary has really helped to shape you. And I, I'm just struck that God uses all that stuff. Sometimes that stuff doesn't seem relevant or it seems like our, our life has taken a detour or how does it all work together? But God has a way of taking the different experiences and learnings of our lives and and working it together. And, and so, you know, here you are um, in, a, in a work environment that you weren't expecting, but so much of what you studied and learned and experienced, uh, God is using for God's purposes now in your life. And you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm just struck by that um, as, as one of the things. The other, and and so I, I'd lo- I'd love to hear a little more about. So you're you're you were thinking you were going to go in one direction. Now you really are sensing more and more a calling into the the, the family business, which ironically was sort of the thing you were raised for, right? Mm-hmm. So you're you're really sort of um, you know uh, sensing that calling. What were some of the things you wrestled with in that in that season of mm-hmm. of really trying to decide whether that really was your calling and whether God really had this for you or not? Or what what was going on with you there? Sure, um, I think if I were to like uh, backtrack a bit and think about the time when I was growing up and how my parents kind of prepared me and my siblings, um, and geared us towards family business. Um, actually growing up, I accepted that. Like I, I, I accepted that a hundred percent. And, um, I was actually a very ambitious child. <laughs> I was, uh, always aiming for like straight A's. Um, there was a time when my parents were, so I was the only one who liked math at home. <laughs> I would go on family vacations and work on like math. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was I was that competitive. Um, and what's funny was 
when I went to college, so first semester I had straight A's and then second semester was literally the year that I fell in love with Jesus. Um, and that year I flunked my first class <laughs> in college. I started failing my classes. Um, Cause all I did. What was the link? Tell, yeah. tell us, tell us what was, <laughs> what was this is like link? reverse evangelism yeah. here. Right? Yeah. What was, the, what was yeah. the link between falling in love with Jesus and failing your classes? Yes. And I have shared this to some youth groups and I would tell them, please don't follow my footsteps yeah. and flunk your classes. Don't do that. Stay in school. <laughs> um, so what happened was in that season, somehow the Lord just drew me to his word um, in a sense that I was so engrossed in scripture. And that was when I really longed to go to seminary. I really mm -hmm. wanted to go into Bible school to learn more about this amazing book that I can't get my hands off. Um, so I would be in my lectures reading my Bible. <laughs> I would be queuing um, in the cafeteria, reading my Bible. And that was literally the year where um, it seemed if someone were to look at my life from an external perspective, they would see that what is going on? Like this girl's literally like throwing her life away. Um, but for me, I think looking back, like that year was such a sweet year where the Lord was molding me um, to know him, to love him and to know that he is enough, you know? And I think that year was uh, when I thought to myself that I wanted to leave everything behind, all the ambition that I had growing up. Um, and for me, I really love him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Fall in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. My gosh, like that, I think that year, like that song was the anthem of my life, where literally, like all the things of earth grew strangely dim. Um, and I just found that nothing could replace the love of God, you know? Hearing that story, it's such an extreme turnaround between being in that place and being today working in finance, <laughs> yes. right? So, yeah. what, <laughs> so yeah. we've, seen the, we've seen the flunking out of your classes for reading yeah. the Bible. How did, we, <laughs> how did the pendulum swing right. in the other direction then? So I think in that year, um, one of the things that I wrestled with was, Lord, can I just drop out? You know, can I just drop out and go to Bible school right away? Um, at that time, uh, I spoke with my pastor. I spoke with some people I trusted as well at church. And I think the same advice was given to me again and again. It was just be faithful. You know, and mm -hmm. so I think in that season, one of the things that I <laughs> begrudgingly um, <laughs> went through was faithful, learning faithfulness, right? Um, learning faithfulness, even when I really didn't feel like staying in college. Um, mm -hmm. But I knew that this was a privilege that my parents had given me. And so I had to finish um, what I started. And so I did. And I finished a master's because that was also part of what they had um, wanted me to finish up. But what's funny was, um, I think, when finally I had the courage to actually ask my parents if I were allowed to go to seminary with their blessing, of course. Um, at first, my dad's response was, just read your Bible. <laughs> and I was like, I have been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I have been doing that. And so. What was he um, hoping that you would find? Um, in scripture? 
Yeah. When he said, just read your Bible, did he mean read your Bible instead of going to seminary? Or yeah, he mean- yeah. He was like, mm. why Why would you want to go to seminary? You can just read your Bible at home and work. Mm. You know? And I was like, oh, it's different, dad. Um, and what's funny was um, when he asked me where I wanted to go and things like that, because I had three years of kind of like thinking through like where I wanted to go, what I wanted to take. Um, when I told my parents, um, it was in LA and things like that. Uh, what's funny was my dad paused for a bit and he was like, what? That's so weird. We just finalized the deal. Uh, we just bought an apartment two weeks ago, um, signed the agreement and it's in LA. And mm-hmm. mind you, at that time, like our family, none of us had planned to go to the US to study. Um, mm-hmm. All of us, my eldest sister, my second sister, we've all gone to Australia for our undergraduate studies and our master's as well. And we haven't even like vacationed to the US often. So it was really odd that my dad had bought an apartment, but apparently it was because the housing market was um, down and it was a good buy and things like that. It was for investment purposes. But literally he just paused and he's like, we just signed an agreement two weeks ago. It's in LA okay, maybe you can go to seminary. In so, LA. In LA. Mm-hmm. So, so you have a place to stay. Since, uh, Why yeah, not? might as well. So I ended up going to LA um, for seminary. Um, graduated within two and a half years. And yeah, thinking, thinking that, um, okay, God is opening up the way for me to um, go into full-time ministry, right? Um, but then again and again, I think um, in seminary, one of the things that um, I think God kept on tugging at my heart was how there's a lot of theologians in the church, right? But when it comes to the workplace, there aren't that many. Um, there are lots of missionaries in the church. But when it comes to the workplace, um, unfortunately, there isn't that many. And mm. I think that was something that softened my heart towards thinking about seeing the workplace as a mission field. Mm. And I think having softened my heart through those two and a half years, um, and also talking through mentors, talking through with mentors and um, people who have actually gone into the workplace to serve and um, to see it as a way to glorify God. I think that really um, affirmed affirmed my decision to eventually um, say yes to coming into the workplace. So, so you came back to your parents after your time in ceremony and you said, thanks so much for this apartment <laughs> in LA. I've decided that now I'm ready to go into the family business. And did they rejoice or did they roll their eyes and say, oh, Jessica. <laughs> no, they rejoiced. Um, I think they saw it coming in a sense that, hmm. no, maybe they didn't really see it coming, but they expected it. Um, they expected me to come back to work with them. Um, in family business. Uh, But I think as we spoke about it as well, like um, I shared with them my own wrestlings and things like that. I think Mm. um, that's something that that I am grateful for, that they also understood. Um, Because coming back home and um, being given roles, especially in the financial service sector, one of the things that I'm quite grateful for that my parents also saw and understood was um, my love to serve particularly um, the less fortunate. And so when I came home, they're like, okay, we have a philanthropy department. You should run it um, since that's where your heart is at as well. So I think those are some things that I'm quite grateful for that uh, my parents also accommodated to where um, I felt called to. Mm. Are there any, now you had a kind of circuitous journey of calling and I don't think, it doesn't sound to me that at any point your calling changed. Mm. 
but it sounds like there were some different experiences God had to lead you through to get to the place that you are today feeling comfortable that you're called to your work. Is there any part of your journey that you regret or you wish, oh, I wish God could have sped that up a little bit? No, actually, I think I'm quite grateful that as much as maybe looking back, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have flunked, <laughs> you know, like, oh, <laughs> I should have worked oh, That's the harder. best part of the story. I like that part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I think really compelling. <laughs> I think um, if anything, like, I love that God forced me to empty myself in that season. Um, and literally see that I have nothing to bring to him. You know, like I wasn't excelling in school. <laughs> I wasn't like, because before it seemed like my sense of achievement was what made me feel like worthy, right? Um, but then in that season, it's like, <laughs> Jessica, you have nothing to bring before me. <laughs> um, but I have enlisted you in my service and it's mm-hmm. because you are my daughter. Um, and I think that's something that, I needed to go through, um, that he had to break through my pride, my sense of achievement, my um, the vice of ambition, right? And I think that was very necessary um, that I had to go through that so that when the time came and the Lord would lead me to the workplace, um, I know that I'm not doing this for my own sake. I know that I'm not, because as human beings, it's so easy for us. I love how John Calvin says that our hearts are a perpetual factory of idols, right? And it is. Um, And so I think recalling again and again, even until today, every time I recall that season in my life, I'm reminded that (laughs) literally I have nothing to bring before the Lord. And that, yeah, every day when God calls us to serve him, it's an honor, it's a privilege, it's an entrustment, and it's something we need to steward well. Mm. Mm. Mark, you know, I, I, go ahead. Well, I'm just because I'm so struck, Jessica, by so many parts of your story. And one of them is the wisdom and grace of your parents. Because as, as you know, because you're in it, but I, I've had many friends over the years who are connected to family businesses and they're, and, and those can be wonderful, but also there are sometimes many mm-hmm. almost chains attaching people, their, their expectations. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, it was both wise and gracious. And I think somewhat courageous of your parents to give you the space because had they not done that, you might very well be doing it you were still working in the company today but you you'd be a very different person and for a very different reason you wouldn't have chosen it you wouldn't have sensed it as much god's calling as obligation or as a place to continue to earn your worth by excelling and doing great and and just so all of the so for one thing so the wisdom of your parents and their grace but then i'm just struck again by the the grace of god in your story because again you know, you could have gone into business with this notion that you're going to prove your worth and value by how, how great you are at it and your success and your excellence. And, and that can really get caught up, of course, in our relationship with God. But mm-hmm. through that process of kind of setting you free from a lot of that, so you could finally set that aside and then leading you through this process of growth so that you could choose uh, in response to God's grace and the grace of your parents, really, to to be in the family business now, not because you had to or not because it was the place you were going to prove how great you were, but out of out of service to God and to people. And I, I'm just so I'm struck by sort of how your parents in many ways and God in many ways in your life were, were quite similar. And, you know, there there is a lot in scripture that's like that. I mean, I think it's not the same story, but I think of the parable of the prodigal son. And now, not that you went off and you know lived as the son did. <laughs> for your case, it was going to college and seminary. But there was a sense in which your parents set you free, huh. and yeah. and you in that in that experience of freedom and growth, then were able to return 
in a very different way out of freedom. And so I, I, I love how that's true for you with respect to your parents, but also with respect to the Lord, that, that your service to God is now not kind of proving yourself so much as a response to grace and to God's call in your life. Oh, Mark, I love that you mentioned the parable of the prodigal son, which is a story in Luke chapter 15, because Thank you, Leah. It, it's a different story of calling from many of the calling stories that we hear in the Bible. So I think for a lot of us whose story of calling, personal calling is kind of circuitous. We went here, we uh-huh. went there, we weren't sure. Maybe we feel like, oh, I wasn't like Moses, like God talked to you from the bush. You know, I didn't have this direct sense of calling, but the story of the prodigal son, the son who leaves his family in order to realize what good work he had with his mm-hmm. family and then comes back. That's a different kind of story about calling. I don't know, Mark, would you uh, say that that's well, about calling as well? Well, calling is certainly part of it, but yes, but it's certainly about grace. And the other part <laughs> of it is, ironically, the elder son in that parable who was the guy who continued to work faithfully in the family business Mm -hmm. was filled with bitterness and resentment. Right Mm -hmm. there. there, And and so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because I think when most of us read that parable, we don't think in terms of calling or family business, we think of family relationships, but Mm -hmm. that whole thing is framed as a kind of a family business story. And where, where one is set free, really messes up, Mm -hmm. but then is able to return to the grace of the father, the other who is the, you know, the faithful good son is resentful and, and distant relationally. So anyway, mm-hmm. I, Jess, I'm talking a lot. It, has a, <laughs> no, has that terrible it. ever, ever struck you in that way, Jessica? Have you? Yeah, I think I, I love that you mentioned that because I think for the most part, actually, um, I always saw myself, I often saw myself as the almost like the, the older brother. You know, uh-huh. who, in a sense that um, should or if I hadn't like if 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 the Lord hadn't given me that space, if my parents hadn't given me that space um, to also wrestle with my own sense of calling, I think my response would definitely be more begrudging, <laughs> like the older. Um, son um, because in my nature um, I tend to be more of the timid daughter who Mm. tends to be more obedient Um, and so I wouldn't really I guess reject my parents um, giving of perhaps like a role or responsibility I wouldn't reject it outright, you know, um, but because I was given that space um, to wrestle with it um, and not be immediately forced into the work, um, I'm thankful that it gave me opportunity to not grow in resentment. Mm-hmm. I think um, because I think it would be very easy to do that. I think. Um, one of the things that I love that scripture teaches us is glad obedience, right? Um, when, when God calls us not to simply offer sacrifices, but obedience from the heart, which is supposed to be glad obedience. Um, but oftentimes as, especially as children growing up in, um, family businesses and things like that, um, it's so easy to be drawn into or obliged to obey, to follow, to um, do as what is expected, um, but without gladness, <laughs> without mm. a sense of purpose, um, without um, a sense of direction um, or a sense of calling um, for our own selves. And so I think I'm um, I'm very fortunate. I, I'm very thankful that I was given that space for sure. Mm. Jessica, is there a piece of advice that you would give our listeners, someone who is maybe earlier than you are in their journey or just thinking about how do I, 
how do I wrestle with is my calling to the workplace? Is it, it with family? Is it if they're just asking these questions, what would be, you know, one piece of advice that you would give someone in that position? Oh man. Yeah, that's a hard, that's a mm. tough question. Um, because I do believe that God calls us all um intimately and personally and if anything um so i i work with youths a lot of youths uh usually and that's a question that's a very um live question for a lot a lot of them and always one of the things that i have to highlight is whenever we talk about calling and vocation um first and foremost remember that we are first called to Christ himself, to Christ, Mm. to Christ likeness, um, to follow and um, seek him. And I think, secondly, I think uh, there is a quote by Elizabeth Elliot that I really, really like. And I think um, this was one of the quotes that helped me as well um, wrestle with my own sense of calling. It is um, that the Lord calls every Christian, regardless of where they are at in their lives, to the same amount of obedience to take up your cross and follow. So mm. I think um, for me, to be honest, even with me sharing all this and saying that, oh, I think I do believe that this is where the Lord is calling me to. It's not to say that every day I wake up and feel so ready for work, you know? <laughs> it's not as though every day I wake up and, and, and feel like, okay, this is where the Lord's called me to. Like, okay, I'm ready to go to my mission field. No, that's not what I'm saying. There are a lot, a lot of days um, where I would wake up groggy and like, I don't even want to go to work. <laughs> um, but I think when we follow Christ. And um, we know that our call is to self-denial, to pick up our crosses and to follow Jesus, even in those times when we don't feel like it, right? Um, We can show up, we can be faithful. Um, And I think this is also where like those years of me um, almost loathing college, but still trying to um, finish because that Mm. was what I believed was the faithful thing to do. I think um, the Lord's molding um, of us through the years and in teaching us faithfulness will never be in vain because I think one of the things that I love is uh, when Jesus also talks about um, at the end when we are supposed to see him face to face. What is what is it that we want him to say? It is well done, my good and faithful servant. Mm-hmm. And so it's never been well done, my productive servant. <laughs> well done, my <laughs> my super successful. Uh, 30 under 30 uh, servant. It's never been about that. It's always been about good and faithful work. And so I Mm -hmm. think that's something that um, wherever we are um, called to or whatever it is we're wrestling with, um, I think the question that we need to be asking is, Lord, what is the most faithful thing for me to do right now? Um, particularly Mm. what is the most faithful thing? How am I most faithful to you? And how am I most faithful to the work that you have entrusted to my care, the people you've entrusted to my care? Because different seasons also call for different um, sets of uh, considerations. So Mm. what's most faithful? I love it. What is the, Mm. what's the most faithful thing that I can do today? How can I follow you? Even if it's just, out of bed (laughs) and to my regular job. Yes. I love it. Jessica Tanacity Bio, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's really Mm. been a pleasure to learn from your experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
That's our show. Don't miss the next episode. Be sure to subscribe. And if you like what you've heard, please leave a review. We'd love to hear from you and it helps other people find us. Thanks for listening.